go. Ok, allora, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. It is a privilege for me to welcome all of you to the opening session of the ETF UNESCO International Conference Week. I would like also to welcome our friends who are following us on Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. My name is Simona Rinaldi. I work at ETF. As you can see, I'm not alone here. I'm in a good company, but especially, actually, I will moderate today with the ETF director, Mr. Cesare Onestini. So hello, Cesare, and thank you for being with us. Buongiorno. So before we officially, in fact, start with our director, let me just remind you a few features about LifeBit. We have a homepage where I'm sure you went through, where actually you can watch the live session. In case you are not following your preferred language, just go back to the homepage and select the right square, the one, let's say, referring to your language. And this is information number one. Number two, should you have any comment, we don't have any section in this opening one hour to question and answer, but should you have any comment, put it on the actually icon where it's written, written question and answers. And then you also have the social wall. What is a social wall? It's a place where actually you can go. You, should, you could go before, but please go after the event and leave us any messages. So whenever you change from the homepage, you disconnect, but go on the social wall and tell us something. And then finally, don't forget that we have the icons in the final slide that actually the regia is going to show us where you have actually the icon for the Mentimeter. Mentimeter is the last one and is our way to engage with you. We will have a poll, be ready, follow us. So again, today is the first day of our journey together within this ETF UNESCO International Conference Week. I underline week because it's going to be a week full of events. We will actually have a three days of thematic session with practitioners who actually are the ones who implement and benefit from change. These three days of thematic session will lead up to one and a half day of high level event with actually designer of system, say, of system change. What do we want to do? We <laughs> want to reflect on good practices and we also need, I think, at this point in time to reconfirm on priorities. Last but not least, we have the Ideas Bazaar. The Ideas Bazaar is a virtual experience that actually goes around the six thematic areas of our conference. When you will see the Ideas Bazaar all along the week, stay tuned, actually. And at the end, if you go back to the social wall, the one I was referring at the beginning, you click on the link and you can go through this immersive experience. We hope you will like it at least as much as we do. I think now we are all ready. If you are ready, I guess I can pass the floor to the ETF director, Cesare Onestini. Thank you. Thank you, Simona, and uh, welcome to all our distinguished uh, speakers and guests to this international conference on building lifelong learning systems, skills for green and inclusive societies in the digital era. We are really in a global conference here today, and I think this is a very promising sign for the discussions that we want to have together. Uh, we are together in this virtual space, which has become a sort of home for all of us uh, in the last uh, year and a half. Uh, and this uh, should be also a point of strength for us uh, to rethink the way in which we work, uh, exchange and shape our ideas for the future steps we need to take. The confidence we are hoping today really takes us in a shared direction. And this is why I'm particularly happy that we are hosting this conference together with partners who will speak just after me, uh, because this shared direction is changing the way in which we are looking at the world of learning, of education and training, of skilling, reskilling and upskilling. Uh, we want to have a vision uh, that will make our society green and inclusive. And the goal is really to reconfirm what we have uh, said in the 2030 development goals and really accelerate uh, the, uh, the uh, delivery of these goals. 
As we uh, move up uh, and we uh, look at the uh, world uh, of education, or so we can say that never before in human history, we had gone through such a shared experience as the pandemic. Uh, this has been a challenge for us, but it's also something that should make us stronger and should confirm our ability to uh, focus on our shared commitments uh, with partners within the European Union and beyond it. Within uh, this, we have the European Green Deal setting a frame for our future action and for the goals we want to achieve. As policymakers, we have an obligation to think ahead. We need to ensure that learning opportunities uh, support the realization of our goals in a matter that is enshrined in our system. And during this week, this is what we have. We have this opportunity to explore and discuss with policymakers, practitioners, international actors, the way in which we want to build these lifelong learning systems. We'll be looking at many points of views. We'll be taking into account many dimensions of lifelong learning systems and how they change from the economic to the education, labor market, finance, public administration, civil society, youth, and many different perspectives. And these voices will all be heard in the week ahead. Why is this so important? Well, if I go back uh, a couple of years ago when we had a, a bigger conference on future of skills, um, at, back then I made a couple of statements at the opening. Um, one was that we need policies that need to take the future into account. And another statement was that we need to translate this into what happens in classrooms. But this week, uh, the topics we want to discuss really challenge these statements uh, because they bring us back to the fact that over these years, we have learned many things, we have lived through the pandemic, we have developed many activities. And as we open this conference, we have a clear vision that shapes the future ahead. And this is the question, the challenge of greening and inclusion. And secondly, we have also seen that what happens in the classroom is also just part of the challenge, but we really need to bring the learning, this lifelong learning we talk about, we need to bring it to all environments beyond the classroom and across life. So is this the beginning of a new era for our education and training systems? This is the discussion, the question we want to share and we want to see uh, together with you all. Um, we will find out throughout the week and this discussion will bring us to hopefully a shared vision of how we want to move ahead. We will explore this together with many partners and in particular, I'm thankful to UNESCO, the EBRD, ILO, and UNICEF that with us have shaped the content of this conference. And I'm very really happy now to pass the floor to our co-organizer of the conference, uh, Boren Chakrun, uh, Director, Division for Policies and Lifelong Learning Systems of UNESCO, um, with whom we share a specific objective of the conference, in particular, <clears throat> looking at the global strategy for Tibet. UNESCO is shaping this in cooperation with the international community. Boren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cesare, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, Cesare, their colleagues from ILO, EBRD, UNICEF, distinguished guests, their participants, very warm greetings. Bonjour, salam, dobri den. Let me start my remark with main, my main message. My main message today, to, today is that the crisis has exacerbated inequalities and seriously threatens development gains made over decades across the globe, and that we need to cooperate more closely than ever to leave no one behind. There is no doubt we are facing a crisis unlike in any in the recent history of humankind. The magnitude of the crisis is unparalleled. COVID-19 COVID shattered schools around the world leaving more than 1.6 billion learners, children, adults out of school early in the pandemic. Young people have been severely affected, especially those entering higher education and training, adults participating in literacy programs, and those who graduated in 2020 and 2021 and tried to enter the labor market during the pandemic. Those risk seeing their careers affected permanently. The economic recession is impacting resources allocated to education and training. According to the last education financing watch conducted by UNESCO, 65% of poorer countries are cutting their uh, education budget, 
and the share of resources allocated to education stimulus packages is less than 2%. The situation in the labor market is not uh, better. In 2021, over 64 million employed youth and 145 million young workers around the world are living in poverty. Too many are settling for work in informal sectors and rural livelihoods, or jobs for which they are overqualified and underpaid. Employment losses in 2020 translated into rising in inactivity and disengagement. And as a result, extreme poverty, which was expected to decrease by 31 million in 2020, increased by up to 93 million. Therefore, I believe we have all such profound obligation to build a more inclusive world driven by our ideals on human rights, equity, inclusion, and gender equality. And our unending hope for better lives, no matter who we are, where we come from, what is our name, Cesare, Borhan, or Barbara, religion, ethnic minority, or color of our skin. And we must be bold on, on the defense of these obligations. Personally, this is perhaps the primary thing that gets me out of bed every morning and makes me excited to go to work. In this event, we'll speak about lifelong learning, which is tightly linked with the world of work. However, never before has the future of work been so uncertain. The future of work will depend on paths and results of wide range of transition, including Industry 4.0, the climate change and green of economies, the changing dynamics of informal sector, demography and social transitions, and obviously the recovery path from COVID-19. Today, in this landmark event, we should say enough is enough. It's time that every human being on the planet has access to high quality learning opportunity. And we need to discuss the way we need to radically transform education, training, work, economies and societies at large to achieve this goal. So today, let's ask ourselves, if we want to leave no one behind and spare our planet, what change we want to see, what progress we want to achieve, this is our chance to work together to answer that call in this moment. This is time to work together to find solutions and open doors for lifelong learning opportunities and promote the cause of sustainable development and reclaim the dream of leaving no one behind. You may ask, this is possible. Is this within reach? By when? Let me share very briefly some perspective. I believe this requires policy commitment, partnerships, and systems that are able to offer lifelong learning opportunities. For all, and all means all. I see three lenses, a right-based lens, an economic lens, and a societal lens. Let me briefly say that the right-based lens is that every system should ensure every person to learn, work, and thrive. System will need new tools and resources, including tools such as youth guarantee, individual learning account, digital technology that can offer personalized and adaptive and flexible learning processes and pathways. Qualification system, credentialing system that includes micro-credentials and other ways of recognizing skills and learning happening in different contexts. An economic vision means that every economy should ensure it leverages skills towards sustainable path. In all we do, our commitment to opportunities for all has to be at the centerpiece of our agenda. We know it, economies do better when everyone has a chance to succeed. But we all know that millions of jobs could be fully automated in the coming years, and many others will see significant change. At the same time, technological process will create new jobs with very different skills requirements, including advanced digital skills, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, art as well. So the role of the private sector here is critical in expressing the skills needs, in offering work-based learning, in investing in skills, recognizing and certifying and valuing the skills and qualifications acquired. Let me finish with a societal vision, which, which we sometimes we neglect. Every society should promote skills for citizenship, inclusiveness, resilience, and well-being. Of course, every society faces different forms and intensity of temporary crises, such as those of political representation, governance and quality of democracy, the acceleration of prejudice and discrimination, hate speech, disengagement, and social unrest. But lifelong learning can play a role here. 
It implies the renewal of content, skills and pedagogies, including problem-based learning, collaboration and civic competencies, digital and information literacy, skills in the art, skills for well-being, and the sense of global solidarity. Indeed, this is a complex task, a complex task. No government can respond to this task alone. It is a global. We need policy learning and multilateral cooperation in this case. UNESCO, for example, launched a global cooperation and coalition to leave no one behind. But today's event reflects the spirit of partnership. Cesare, you mentioned that earlier, bringing together UNESCO, ETF, ILO, UNICEF, EBR, EBRD, country's representative, private sector and civil society. We have been working as one that during the past year, including through the interagency group on TVET. We conducted joint surveys, joint webinars, joint reviews, joint publications. We will continue to act in partnership to fulfill the promise of our common and sustainability agenda. We will work together and we are responsible and accountable for that together. It is summertime in this part of the world. So let's fully plunge in the lifelong learning debate. Thank you. Salam. Au revoir. Do svidaniya. Thank you, Boren. And uh, thank you for setting out the scene, uh, not simply about the challenges emerging from the pandemic, but also a vision for what uh, could be uh, the beginning of many solutions. And thanks to UNESCO for the work that UNESCO has been leading in this time. It is my pleasure now to welcome Afshan Khan, uh, she's the regional director of, for Europe and Central Asia for UNICEF. Uh, with UNICEF, UNICEF here in ETF, um, we have a strong partnership. And in particular, over the past few months, we have done something that we treasure a lot. We have done uh, uh, we have done an effort to give voice to the youth in this time of pandemic and hear their views uh, of how we can shape a better future. Afshan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Greetings to all on behalf of UNICEF. As other speakers have said, lifelong learning is becoming the new normal for today's generation of children and young people. Our world and global and local economies are facing rapid transformation brought about by digitalization, automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so many other new trends. So there's widespread agreement that it'll be essential for every child to have a chance to keep learning and build the skills and competence and confidence needed to adapt to rapidly changing environments. As we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic, adolescents and young people are amongst the most affected by these changes. Many are saying that they were the last to be hired, but the first to be fired but they were also the ones who were quickest to adapt to an almost overnight massive shift towards an online gig economy and adapt to having an app as their first boss. While this gave youth opportunities to gain income and experience, many of the jobs in the digital economy disproportionately employ youth in jobs that are often precarious, underpaid, have limited job security, protection, or benefits. As we move forward, we must do better to support adolescents and youth to determine their learning pathways in an uncertain world. But we can also learn from them. If we're to build new learning systems that work together, we need to co-create together with young people. We need to use the key principles of human-centered design for building human capital. We must involve young people to understand their needs and experience, their views on what, where, and how they prefer to learn, what works, and what can be improved. Their ideas can help make learning systems more flexible and adaptable and help develop appropriate policies, learning content, new training and learning platforms, as well as sources and modalities that would be able available to all, including to the most marginalized learners who are currently dropping out. This is why through the strong partnership that UNICEF has had with the European Training Foundation, 
we have reached out and consulted with thousands of young people from countries in the Europe and Central Asia region to hear their opinions, views, and sentiments about lifelong learning, about social inclusion, and about green transition, all key themes of this week-long conference. Through opinion polls using our U Report program that allows instant dialogue with thousands of youth, we heard that young people are very open and passionate about the future that awaits them. On average, 8.5 thousand young people aged 14 to 24 answered each of our opinion polls. They have aspirations, but they are weary about the capacity of their schools to give them the skills and guidance they needed. Through in-depth focus groups, they also signal the drastic changes they expect from education policies and systems to make lifelong learning a reality. What young people told us is key. More than half of the young people feel that schools have prepared them only a little or not at all for future studies and employment. Only a third feel they have enough information to choose their future studies or career. And for many, the internet and social media are their main sources of information. They worry about the shortages of jobs in the Europe and Central Asia region. And this is even worse for minorities or youth with disabilities who face discrimination and access barriers. They struggle to get their first job, which is so essential to open doors for future employment. On inclusion, we also heard about the widespread discrimination with only 20% of young people saying in their countries there is support for inclusion, with the predominant reason for discrimination, harassment, or exclusion being sexual orientation, disability, ethnic, or religious background. But more importantly, over 60% said they themselves have experienced or witnessed discrimination bullying or exclusion in their school. Something needs to be done about this. On greening, we also heard about a key topic that is mobilizing many young people. More than 90% feel that a green economy is important and the majority think their government is not doing enough to create a green economy. And young people are committed and ready to take action for the planet and wish that the education system would do more to teach them relevant skills for greening and adapting towards a circular economy. You can read about all of these findings in far more detail in our joint ETF report. Young people are also proposing some solutions for addressing discrimination for more flexible education curricula, training of teachers, career guidance, and orientation, and ways in which they can build skills for the future, like critical thinking, problem solving, socio-emotional skills, and greening skills. Many of the actions proposed by youth are clearly aligned with UNICEF's programming in the Europe and Central Asia region. We are working with governments, key partners on upskilling and reskilling of youth through formal and informal pathways, improving the quality of learning and equal access to learning devices and quality content for all learners, regardless of geography, ethnicity, socioeconomic status or disability. We're connecting children to internship opportunities and to innovations so that they can build their competence, confidence, and contributions. And we are working to address air pollution and climate change in the region. And as we work together to build new lifelong learning systems that will strengthen the skills and employability prospects for youth, and as we build more inclusive and greener societies and communities, we must put in place 
sustainable mechanisms and reliable ones to systematically include young people at the policy table and as actors for change. This is a good practice, not only for the economy, but also for our societies, because through meaningful participation, young people can learn about the core European values of inclusion, respect, dignity, and human rights. The involvement of young people and their contribution towards this conference is a good example to follow. UNICEF is committed to continue to work with ETF and all the other partners here today and with young people to strengthen the policy dialogue and participation mechanisms for youth at the local, national, and regional levels. So they're able to realize their potential, shape the present and the future that they want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Afshan. Thanks for sharing these uh, important insights, but also thanks for this call to action. And I hope this call to action will be echoed throughout uh, the week. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Barbara Rambusek. She's the Director for Gender and Economic Inclusion um, uh, and uh, um, Department of Country and Sector Economics at the EBRD. EBRD is a strong partner of ETF. We have been uh, sharing uh, work in many different countries. We look at the world of business, employment, and inclusion because we share the common uh, view that inclusion is good for people, but it's also good for business. And on this, the floor is yours, Barbara. Thank you very much, Cesare. And I'm really delighted to be here today um, at this very important event to promote skills for a green, inclusive, and digital future for all. Indeed, this agenda is fully aligned with the uh, three priorities that um, we at the EBRD also have for the coming five years, which focus on enhancing equality of opportunity, as well as supporting a green and also a digital transition. Addressing skills needs during times of transformational change continue, con constitutes one of the most pressing challenges in building back better and more equal economies. We need to devise effective mechanisms to rebuild human capital that has been lost during the pandemic lockdowns and redouble our efforts to strength, strengthen equal access to economic opportunities, which, as we know, have been se severely affected. Basically, we need to not only reverse the regressive developments that we are seeing over the past 18 months, but also improve the status quo that we had before the crisis. At EBRD, we are stepping up our activities in this area, building on our close relationship and engagement with the private sector, but also, as you just mentioned, on the very close partnership that we have with the European Training Foundation, to develop skill solutions that meet the evolving needs of employers and enable people from across our region to fully participate in the economy. We look forward to launching our new Equality of Opportunity strategy and also our strategy for the promotion of gender equality later this year. Based on a human capital approach, we will seek to support the building of lifelong learning systems, spanning across solutions for equal entry into jobs, more transparent career pathways and professional progressions, continuous skills developments that boost workers' adaptability, strategic labor force development approaches in response to future, work, um, future of work trends. So how will we do that? At EBRD, we drive to transition towards more inclusive market economies by harnessing the power of the private sector to promote skills, jobs, and sustainable livelihoods, to build inclusive business environments, and to create gender responsive services. The private sector has a key role to play in building more inclusive, lifelong learning systems. It provides continuous work-based learning opportunities, it can help improve skill standards together with education providers and policymakers, and it can adopt measures and standards to ensure equal access to skills developments for all. In boosting greener economies, for example, we leverage our engagement with enterprises and policy partners to ensure that workers and communities affected by the transition away from fossil fuels are not left behind. Instead, we seek a just transition towards a green economy for all. As part of our Green Cities programs, for example, we work with mayors and authorities across over 40 cities to promote equal opportunities in areas such as access to green jobs and skills, inclusive urban service provision, 
inclusive policy making and public consultations. In addressing the challenges and opportunities of the digital transition, we nudge the private sector to support wider access to learning and employment through online education, remote working and platform economy approaches. We help companies develop market relevant training programs on digital skills and digital literacy, as well as reskilling initiatives for workers with stranded skills that are at risk of being left behind due to automation and other technological uh, changes that are coming. To achieve lasting impact, partnerships are at the very core of how we can actually achieve impact. In this context, I would really like to highlight the very successful partnership between the, the EBRD and the European Training Foundation, which is based not only on the close complementarity of our mandates and our capacities, but also the strong relationships that we have built over many years now to deliver together more than we could do each on our own. And this is also why today's event and the events that are coming throughout the next few days are so important. It's by coming together that we learn from each other, that we share best practice and lessons learned and experience. And this is how we can jointly amplify our impact. So with that, let me wish you a very successful, thought-provoking and inspiring Skills Week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Barbara. And uh, I can only echo uh, your last words on the good cooperation, but also I'd like to pick up your call, not just to uh, build them back, but to uh, improve on the status quo. I think this is the challenge, and I hope that the discussions we'll have throughout the week will be a small contribution towards this uh, improvement we all see. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Sangyun Lee, who's the Director of uh, Employment Policy Department at the International Labor Office. He's uh, 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 also a close partner of everything we do. And after the centenary declaration where lifelong learning is featured uh, as a pillar supporting uh, the future of the world of work, it's important to accelerate the move towards the achievement of this vision and to get all the social partners fully involved. And it is a pleasure to welcome Sangin. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the ILO, I, first of all, I welcome the, all of you to this conference. Uh, that comes at a very opportune at the moment when like, we are gearing up the economic recovery, particularly focusing on the lifelong learning, its role in actually in one of the most important social economic transition of our age. I also want to thank the European Trading Foundation and UNESCO and UNICEF and EBRD for organizing this important conference together. Uh, last week, actually, the uh, International Labor Conference actually adopted a global call to actions for human central recovery from the COVID-19 crisis that is inclusive and sustainable and resilient. Not surprisingly, this actually call, a global call, highlights the central importance of skills and lifelong learning in human central recovery, particularly calling for strengthening public and private investment in skill development and lifelong learning, including through the universal access to the quality education, more equitable and effective access to training, including over course apprenticeship and career guidance and upskilling and reskilling, and also through the other active labor market policies and partnership which facilitated the successful labor market transition and reduced the skill mismatches, gap, and shortages, including for low skilled and long term unemployed. The ILO's work on the, uh, the life learning has a, a long history, but as many of you, and also as Dr. Cesar already mentioned, the ILO Centenary Declaration on the Future World firmly recognized the role of the uh, lifelong learning especially in enabling individuals to deal with the challenges and seize the opportunities offered by a changing world of work. This is a transformation which requires a continuous improvement, improvement of skills uh, throughout the working life is really a case of, in point. This is why the IL offers a methodology for a rapid assessment of reskilling and upskilling needs in response to the COVID-19 crisis with a strong focus on digital skills. So we are also currently working on the a framework for digitalization of skills and lifelong learning system. Just transition is another example, which requires, again, strong investment in skills to seize new job opportunities and accelerating 
uh, this structural transformation. IRO's actually climate action for jobs initiative, for example, include a very strong focus on skills for greener future as a key area for action. As the many speakers already echoed, I mean, there is a very strong global consensus on the lifelong learning, but at the same time, so much needs to be done to achieve it. I mean, from the IRO perspective, we have highlighted three issues among others. And first, whose responsibility it, it is. Obviously, establishing an effective lifelong learning ecosystem is a joint responsibility requiring active engagement and support of governments, employment, employers, and workers, as well as the educational institutions. Yet again, we need to secure common understanding about this and create clear sense of responsibility for all actors involved. Second, relate to that, what will be delivering mechanism? I mean, this is one of the focus of the conference to, uh, this week. Third, who will finance it? We must devise appropriate financing mechanisms tailored to the, their countries and sector context. At the same time, ensuring the investment in training is not a cost, and, but a real investment with a large individual and social returns. I'm very much certain that this conference will share the crucial insight on these and other related questions. And I very much look forward to actually lively and constructive debates this week. Thank you. You have been doing uh, at the uh, ILO on this. I, I, I particularly want to pick up your call on the joint responsibility aspect. So colleagues, friends, uh, viewers, I think we uh, have come to the end of this first uh, introduction. We can uh, declare our conference week uh, open. Look forward to all the discussions. A big thank to the speaker who joined me uh, today and to their organizations, but we'll see you all throughout the week in the different, more substantial discussions. And by the end of the week, we we'll take stock of what are the main ideas emerging, guiding our action in the future. Thanks a lot, Simona, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Cesare. Actually, thank you all. Uh, we're around 300 in this uh, opening, so I'm very, I'm very happy that actually is now the moment also to, to listen from you. It's now the moment to have a poll. Uh, in the homepage of LiveBeat, for those in LiveBeat and for the Zoomers in the chat and the same for the streamers, you will see a link to Mentimeter. While for all of you who are in LiveBeat, actually, Go to the homepage, click on the icon Mentimeter, and you will be redirected to the poll. We have a couple of questions for you. I uh, would really very much appreciate having your, uh, your answer. Ah, I, I see there are already people replying. So first question, which I also say loudly, which will allow interpretation. What is lifelong learning for you? Option one, an opportunity to keep developing as a person. B an opportunity to improve any career. C, a necessity in this rapidly changing world. D, a burden. We leave a few seconds, so we know that actually is sometimes it's difficult to switch from one platform to the other, but please, if you have the time, or in any case, if you don't reply to Mentimeter, put your comments on the chat. Remember, in LiveBeat, you can actually, there is the icon question and answer, put there your comments, because it will be actually our privilege to build upon your comments. So I repeat, what is lifelong learning for you? I see that for the moment, actually, the week is an opportunity to keep developing as a person and actually is also a necessity. Yes, definitely COVID <laughs> told us how much we needed to be rapid in change. It just thinks about the digitalization, how it was difficult for all of us also in ETF and I think everywhere in the world. Also, considering that in some lucky countries we have very stable internet connection, we change a lot. 
So going back to the, to the first question, before we move to the second one, I see surprise, surprise is an opportunity to develop as a person. Everything in life, in fact, is an opportunity to develop as a person. So thank you so much. Let's move to the following question. And why we move, I just remember that only one person voted a burden. So thanks God we are going in the right direction. So the following question is, why should your friend go for lifelong learning. First option, to find a job or change the one e she hates, <laughs> mamma mia. B, to meet new people. C, to teach others. D, to feel good. So don't be shy, please uh, vote, tell us what are your thoughts. And if you are not in Mentimeter, doesn't matter. We take what we have from here and we get it from your question and answer from the Zoom. We still give a few seconds because there is a kind of delay for the streamers and we want to be as much inclusive as possible. So, but not to waste also too much time because we have very important speakers coming afterwards. I can say that the, to, the first, let's say the winner is to feel good and to find the job that I hate. So at the end of the day, we just want to be good when we are doing what we like the most, to make a long story short. So I think that actually, thanks so much to share your ideas. Now the floor is back to the ETF director, Cesare Onestini. Floor is yours. Thank you to all. Thank you, Simona, and thanks uh, for this uh, quick uh, uh, poll, which really shows what the challenge is at the beginning of this week. Uh, we have been talking about lifelong learning, lifelong learning systems for uh, a long time. Uh, we all have uh, developed our own views and visions, uh, and across uh, countries, we also see that the issue of lifelong learning resonates uh, differently. Um, however, we all share uh, also as part of the commitment uh, to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, we all share uh, a vision of what needs to be done. So we want to uh, help uh, all of us this week to converge on uh, a shared understanding of what are the elements of lifelong learning uh, from the world of education, training, uh, from the world of employment, inclusion, and the digital challenges that we have seen as part of the pandemic response. Um, and in order to do this, we have three uh, great speakers with us uh, in the next session to bring different perspectives, which will uh, help us understand lifelong learning in its uh, complexity, but also translate this into actions. I will introduce them uh, one by one, and I start with uh, Manuela Geleng. She's the director in the Director General for Employment and Social Affairs and Inclusions. We work obviously very closely with our colleagues in the uh, commission, and in particular uh, with uh, the colleagues working with uh, Manuela uh, on the uh, skills agenda uh, for Europe. And we are particularly happy to uh, be able to share uh, the views of the European institutions on lifelong learning. Manuela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cesare, uh, for having the opportunity to uh, address uh, uh, this uh, grand conference opening. And good morning to you all. Uh, I think the Mentimeter was an excellent introduction uh, to, to this discussion. Uh, for me, lifelong learning is uh, the possibility to be, to be able to learn throughout life. Uh, lifelong learning in Europe is actually uh, enshrined in the European pillar of uh, social rights as right to access quality education, training, and lifelong learning. So of course, we all agree education and training, initial education and training are uh, fundamental but they are only the beginning of a long journey of learning. But what we see today is actually that two out of five adults do not learn enough to prepare for work, for the work of tomorrow. Uh, the green and the digital transitions accelerate the pace, uh, skills uh, become faster obsolete. And I think we just saw in the Mentimeter that the necessity of lifelong learning was clearly uh, understood by a large number of uh, participants. 
At the same time, it's also true that we stay longer in the workforce. So the need to adapt is constant and throughout our uh, working lives. And in this sense, um, the European Union has set uh, itself a, a target to reach 60% of adults participating in training by 2030. Uh, it's, you might say it's an ambitious target because actually today we are at 37%, but I do think it is a must. And uh, it, uh, it was understood as an important target and endorsed by uh, the European leaders in, at the social summit in Porto just a few weeks ago, together with social partners and civil society organizations. I think it's, an impo it's important to have a target that guides us in our efforts to upskill and reskill. Cesare, you mentioned uh, the skills agenda. Uh, the Commission, as part of the skills agenda, has set a number of initiatives in motion. Two are coming by the end of the year. One is uh, one that looks at empowering individuals to take up learning uh, through individual learning accounts in the way to make access to training possible for all. And the other initiative is one about micro-credentials. So giving the opportunity to those that undertake training to get their training uh, recognized and valued um, by uh, their employers. So uh, it's clear that uh, we all have a, a, a huge challenge before us. Also, if we look at uh, digital, uh, digital skills, we see that today 42% of Europeans have only basic digital skills. And uh, we have set ourselves a target for 2030, that is that at least 80% should have basic digital skills. So uh, also here we are doing, uh, we are working on a digital skills certificate that would facilitate the recognition of digital skills by employers, social partners and, and stakeholders. Equally on green, uh, uh, green will create new occupations or will transform the jobs uh, that are out there. So there is, all the more the need to upskill and reskill. And for these transitions uh, to happen, they need to be socially fair and just. And for that to happen, people need to have the right key that opens their door to, the, to their future. And that is skills. So let me just conclude that lifelong learning is not an option. It's the key to our collective success. More investment is indeed needed from the public, but also from uh, the private sector. And this is why events like this uh, today are important to raise awareness, but also most importantly, to catalyze action for skills. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Manuela. Um, in particular, thanks for uh, um, bringing to our attention also the important discussions at the Social Summit in Porto. I really uh, encourage everybody to have a look if you haven't had the time uh, to uh, those uh, conclusions, because as you rightly said, I think we are also witnessing a change of gear in the way in which lifelong learning is becoming a driver for reforms and change. And thanks for sharing with us some of the very concrete uh, measures that are being put on the table. Uh, and I think now it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Srinivas, Srinivas Reddy. He's the chief of the skills and employment branch uh, at the ILO. Uh, we have heard from uh, Mr. Lee uh, what is the uh, broad vision in the ILO for lifelong learning, uh, but we uh, like to know more uh, about how the ILO is uh, 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 developing uh, the uh, vision into actions and who better than Srinivas to share this with us. Srinivas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Cesare. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you and all the colleagues at the ETF and uh, UNESCO for jointly organizing this excellent conference, very timely. Uh, I also want to you know, send warm greetings to our collaborators, uh, UNICEF and EBRD, also the European Commission and other colleagues have joined. Um, I think the issue of lifelong learning has uh, 
is not a new concept, uh, but it may mean different things to different people. Uh, I, I would like to just throw a bit more light on, you know, how exactly the ILO is uh, uh, addressing this issue and, and what are some of the priorities for us. Uh, Cesare, you have already covered it so well and also Borhan. Um, the issue of lifelong learning, why is it necessary and what is it about and why people interpret it differently? Uh, for us, lifelong learning, uh, you know, at least to me, is a self-explanatory concept that education and skills development for all people throughout their active stages of life. In fact, when the future of work was a, uh, was a subject for our centenary, the ILO's Global Commission on Future of Work has gone into this issue at great length and recommended that there should be a universal entitlement to lifelong learning for all people. I think this is what Borehan also has said, enough is enough. We must strive to ensure that every person walking the earth have the right to access education and skills development throughout one's active life. I think that will be the true development of the world in a, in a just and equitable manner. But why do we need this lifelong learning at all? Uh, you know, in our view, in order to ensure that all individuals can successfully manage their transitions, be it, you know, beginning from school to work transition, but that is just one transition, but people have to go through several transitions today. School to work, work to, fam work to family, family to work, and work to work, and work to re retirement. And so in order for uh, people to be able to uh, make these transitions in a smooth way, uh, lifelong learning, reskilling, and upskilling is fundamental. Therefore, we see that lifelong learning uh, has to be recognized as a guiding principle of education and training. There is a paradigm shift that has to happen. Instead of focusing on just initial education, the education system itself has to uh, move uh, towards lifelong learning as the guiding principle. This is the key insight also from the ILO Centenary Declaration, what we call a human-centered capabilities approach to lifelong learning. Um, so, it's like, so the lifelong learning is all about human capital formation through skills acquisition, reskilling, upskilling, and career transitions. But also importantly, I think the key dimension about maintaining uh, work-life balance, so the acquiring skills for citizenship contributing to communities and personal accomplishment. This is also an important uh, angle um, in the lifelong learning concept. So uh, I also would like to uh, raise an important element into this. People have to involve in lifelong learning. There is a very clear um, evidence now growing that it requires a renewed focus on investing in foundational and core skills. So the foundational skills, the core skills, uh, we'll, we'll have to also basically touch upon the issues like learning to learn and even unlearn. Uh, and, and with these transitions now, what we see in digital and green transitions, uh, every person also as part of the core skills will have to also see how one can acquire basic digital skills and green skills as part of the foundational program. So this is also important to note that a lot of learning courses outside formal environment and training programs uh, only can be made relevant to acquire formal qualifications. But as, as Manuela mentioned, I think uh, this is the right time to put processes for recognition of all forms of learning, including recognition of prior learning, but also recognition of continuous learning to facilitate this lifelong learning to be really uh, realistic and that people can use it in the either lab market or outside. So we need to really uh, see how can we promote awareness and also put systems in place regarding a wide range of solutions on this recognition system. Lastly, I would like to just uh, mention, uh, reiterate uh, the importance of uh, how do we uh, really develop this lifelong learning approaches and reskilling and upskilling. Uh, a, a lifelong learning ecosystem as Sheng Yun has already mentioned. This requires, uh, in my view, uh, three things. One is that a whole of society approach for the whole issue of education and skills development, and within which whole of government approach is fundamental. It's not just about you know, the skills development or education is the education ministry job, and, and, and later on an employment ministry comes in. Yeah. All these relevant ministries have to take responsibilities. Whole of government 
and any education and lifelong learning policies have to be developed and delivered through a process of social dialogue with active participation of businesses and private sector and workers organizations and i also want to just reiterate that as a shared responsibility the lifelong learning and skills development is a shared responsibility between individuals uh, enterprises and uh, and the governments uh, that is the way forward in terms of really promoting i i just also want to finally mention that the what covid pandemic has shown its ugliest one of its ugliest faces through the digital divide a great opportunity to what i see is that millions of people could not go to schools and and uh, skills development programs are uh, mainly in in the developing world because they they do not have access to uh, online and digital learning so maybe here is an opportunity to really bridge the digital divide so the digital and blended learning brings new opportunities and potentially lowers the threshold for access but most importantly we need to address the issue of digital divide as equipment bandwidth and digital skills first of all have to be you know the access has to be provided training programs have to be relevant and linked to qualifications and not to forget that individuals and, and enterprises need support to successfully enter this new environment of a digital economy so skills development so inclusive skills development is crucial and here is an opportunity to bridge the digital divide i think we can all uh, do our bit thank you very much isari thank you uh, srinivas and uh, thanks for uh, connecting the big vision of the uh, universal entitlement enshrined in the in the centenary declaration to what are the reforms and the shared responsibility we have in order now to move and implement this and i think after uh, your intervention and the words of manuela before we see that there is a lot of overlapping on the way that we see the challenge but also the way forward and this is uh, very exciting for the discussions that we will have uh, during the week and uh, to uh, round up this uh, uh, introduction on what is lifelong learning uh, as we all know unesco as an institute dedicated to lifelong learning and we have a message from uh, the director david acerena to bring us their view and their experience as part of our reflection UNESCO promotes a humanistic vision of lifelong learning, a vision that supports inclusive and sustainable societies. Within that vision, lifelong learning can be defined through five essential components. A dynamic approach to learning, learning as a journey that begins at early childhood and extends throughout life. An inclusive approach, providing learning opportunities to all people of all ages, and backgrounds making learning an instrument for empowerment and against social inequalities lifelong learning also recognizes all modalities of learning including formal education and non-formal and informal learning and it takes place in various places within educational institutions of course but also in community spaces at work in libraries museums and increasingly at home with online learning Lifelong learning is also about linking different types and levels of education from early childhood care and development to higher education, TVET and adult education. This involves building bridges between formal and non-formal learning environments and establishing flexible learning pathways. Finally, lifelong learning is people-centered and human rights based. Its purpose is to provide everyone with the opportunity to reach their full potential from a normative perspective the question today is how to move from the right to education well established in international and national laws to a right to lifelong learning considering the structural changes that the world is facing today with aging population increasing migration deep transformation of the labor market and the emergence of digital societies lifelong learning is more relevant than ever yet many countries are still struggling to fulfill basic literacy and numeracy needs for large segments of the world population lifelong learning remains an aspiration since 2015
2015 and the adoption of the SDGs, including Goal 4 on education, lifelong learning is not only an aspiration, it is a commitment of the international community. Considering that many countries are off track to reach all the SDG 4 targets, more than ever, the challenge is how to transform this aspiration and this commitment into reality. How to embrace a culture of lifelong learning? This is precisely the question that the UIL tried to address through a recent publication called Embracing a Culture of Lifelong Learning, a publication that benefited from the insights of an international group of experts from various disciplines who looked at lifelong learning through a transdisciplinary approach. I would like to outline for you some of the key messages of this report. Recognizing lifelong learning as a common good is an important starting point. Lifelong learning cannot rely only on the market or on public sector provision, but also involves a wide range of actors, community groups, civil society organizations, cities. As a common good, lifelong learning is delivered by a diversified ecosystem. Its content responds to the needs defined by individuals and enterprises, but it also reflects global challenges such as sustainable development, digitalization, health, or global citizenship. As a public good, lifelong learning is also a complex object for public policies. It must be transdisciplinary and intersectoral in design, responding to a diversity of policy goals in education, employment, health, and it must also be interministerial in implementation forcing sector ministries to coordinate their action and sometimes to work together in implementation. Technology and artificial intelligence are emerging as key forces shaping platform learning. They bring new and powerful tools, thanks to technology, learning anything, anywhere, at any time is becoming a reality. With technology also emerge new actors who tend to shape the future of learning. Technology being developed and owned by the private sector, can its use in education become a common good? Can learning applications and learning management systems be co-designed with the learners? What type of regulation is needed from governments? To that effect, UNESCO is currently working on a recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. One of the key messages of the report is to recognize lifelong learning as a human right. And I would like to end on that note. Moving towards recognizing lifelong learning as a human right seems a natural extension of the vision of the Education 2030 agenda to leave no one behind. Through a holistic lifelong learning framework, the scope of this right to learn would be broadened from accessing formal education to guaranteeing continuity of learning throughout life. Recognizing lifelong learning as a human right comprises both an individual and a social dimension. It calls for a learner-centered approach to education, recognizing individuals as autonomous learners able to manage their personal learning biographies. At the same time, the value of collective learning processes must be acknowledged. The social dimension emphasizes learning to care for each other, for different communities, and for the planet. As a social right universally accessible to all citizens, the right to lifelong learning will serve as an indicator of social justice. Acknowledging lifelong learning as a human right must involve the recognition, validation, and accreditation of learning outcomes, the free availability of educational resources and open technology, the recognition of the needs of vulnerable groups and the effective integration of this right into legislation. To conclude, we can see that making lifelong learning a reality demands a radical change, a cultural transformation involving many stakeholders, governments, individuals, employers, but also local governments and communities. Beyond supporting individuals' choices and adapting to the future of work, promoting lifelong learning and eventually making it a new human right will be key to collectively address the challenges of the 21st century and shape the future of democratic societies. Thank you.
Thank you, David, and uh, um, thanks for uh, helping us also frame the question from this human rights uh, dimension that is being put on the table uh, as part of the challenges and the goals um, ahead uh, for all of us. Um, as you know, uh, we come to the end of this uh, first uh, introduction. Uh, there is no uh, question and answers here because the rest of the week will be very interactive. But we have asked a colleague here, uh, Jolene Van Houten, to uh, maybe help us in three minutes uh, to sum up some of what she has heard uh, on lifelong learning as uh, a start to the discussions that we we'll have throughout the conference. Jolene. Thank you, Cesare. Um, it's of course a challenge to sum up in three minutes, but let me start with the question we asked, like what is lifelong learning? And we asked this question in the, in the poll and we asked the question to the speakers. And I think the general answer is that we are all learners and that everyone needs to keep learning and developing throughout their lives. And although we have been discussing this topic before, uh, the topic seems to be more pressing than ever due to the digital and green transition, uh, aging population, migration, changing labor markets. And we also heard like the current pandemic only amplifies the need for lifelong learning systems, for lifelong learning. The future of work will look differently. Uh, we will not have one job for life. We need to be ready for several transitions, as we heard. And let me also um, repeat the question uh, raised by Mr. Reddy, like, do we need to put uh, lifelong learning systems as a guiding principle of education? And I think we might find the answer in the title of the conference, Building Lifelong Learning Systems, uh, where we also have the three key themes, green, inclusive, and digital. And from the speeches, I think like the most emphasized of these three themes is still also inclusiveness. Uh, Ms. Leng Galeng pointed out that the participation of adults in learning activities is still low, but we are developing policies and taking initiatives uh, to reach out to more vulnerable groups. Lifelong learning systems should enable everyone to reach their full potential. And we see like we create flexible learning pathways. It's about recognizing learning in different contexts uh, for learners of all ages and all backgrounds. Uh, the development of micro credentials and individual learning accounts are some of the developments we already see. Interesting, here is also the right to quality education and training, or as suggested by both Mr. Reddy and Mr. Mr. Acho Reina, is the right to lifelong learning. Learning needs to be accessible and affordable for everyone. And in this regard, it's also important that everyone perceives it as a right and not as an obligation. Uh, the poll showed us that most of us here today perceive it as an opportunity or maybe a necessity, but at least not as a burden. Uh, but in our discussions, I think this week during the conference, we should not forget that this is not the case for everyone. Uh, some people might feel it like a, a burden. Um, how do we reach in general like vulnerable groups, but also how do we reach people that based on negative learning experiences are less likely to enroll in more formal learning activities? Uh, People-centered approaches were mentioned or suggested by Mr. Chorena. Can we co-design learning? And, and maybe even better, can we co-design lifelong learning systems with people of all ages and all backgrounds? I think it's clear from all contributions this morning that we all have the same ambition. And one message I got already from this session is that we need to join forces to make lifelong learning an opportunity and a reality for all. Luckily, we have this whole week to discuss this uh, and all the ways forward to build inclusive lifelong learning systems. And I invite you all to share your ideas, ask your questions, and I'm sure that I will learn a lot during this conference. Have a good conference and back to Cesare. Thank you so much, uh, Jolene. You did a fantastic job. Now you see why I asked Jolene. I couldn't possibly do such a good job in, in just a few minutes. Uh, but allow me to thank again Manuela, Srinivas and David for really helping us to start off on the right foot and uh, uh, initiate the discussions. And I invite everybody to join the interactive sessions that will take place during the week. Um, we can wrap it up with a short uh, video that we have prepared, uh, summing up some of the uh, thoughts on lifelong learning.
In a world of rapid and disruptive change, education and training needs to cater for the needs of people at all ages and stages in their lives. It must enable people to fulfill their potential, achieve their aspirations, and seize emerging opportunities. It should enable societies to harness the energy and ingenuity of all the citizens and be more resilient and adaptable in the face of global challenges. People face many barriers in learning throughout their lives. They may lack information and guidance to make the right choices. They may lack access to learning opportunities that fit their personal circumstances. They may lack the basic skills to engage with further learning or the time or financial resources to do so. Solutions are out there. Countries are finding ways to help people overcome these hurdles and find their way through what may seem like a maze with many false trails and dead ends. But scattered islands of good practice do not constitute a coherent system through which people can chart a pathway towards better prospects. The challenge is how to build these positive drivers into genuine lifelong learning systems that work for everyone. All the actors need to work together in a coordinated effort with the support of the EU and other donors. Asking ourselves the right questions. How do we adapt learning to anticipate fast-changing skills needs? How do we provide people with the information and advice they need to make the right choices? How do we make learning accessible and appealing enough? How do we involve all the actors that are needed to shape policy and put it into practice? How do we monitor our progress and correct our course when needed? How do we make sure we leave no one behind? Today, we have the opportunity and responsibility to build effective self-sustaining systems that cater for people's real needs, giving everyone access to the skills they need to succeed in the green and digital society of the future. Let's design this system together. If we can imagine it, we can build it. Thank you. If we needed some extra motivation now, we have it and we are ready uh, to go. Um, I would like to just remind you that we have another, we have another important word throughout the conference uh, besides life and learning, which is greening. And in February 21, we have launched a call for green practices to identify uh, best uh, examples. We received over 130 examples uh, from 39 countries. Um, we have uh, been able to select in April, 11 finalists, and we have been put all their stories on the social medias asking you to choose what is the one which you think most represent and most deserves recognition. Uh, they are all winners, but the closing uh, date for the voting will be Thursday, 24th of June. So if you haven't had the time, have a look and vote for your favorite. And then on the 25th of June this week, we will announce the winner and we will uh, give the first ETF Green Skill uh, Award. So please uh, vote and uh, select the best option. I thank again everybody for joining us, especially the speakers who have uh, shared their views, their experience and the word from their organizations. And all of you who have been with us for this opening, see you throughout the week. All the best. Back to you, Simona. Okay, thank you for the final word. Thank, of course, thanks, Cesare. Thanks to everyone. A big merci, spasiba, and shukran iktir. And actually, for those who wish to stay at 10.30, so basically in 15 minutes, and apologies, we've been running out of time, but it was so interesting, it was impossible to stop our speakers. So actually, uh, adapting to a change in skills demand. This is the, the session you are going to see at 10.30. You can see it in streaming, and I'm sure all of you have received invitation. If not, just contact us at the inbox skills for change. 
When you leave live it, don't forget to pass by the social wall and benefit from clicking on the link on the Ideas Bazaar. This will be open for the entire week. Just take the link with you. I can conclude by saying, if we can imagine it, we can build it. Thank you to everyone. Thank you.